Thank you, Priya, for praying. Uh, we have come to the 25th verse of uh, Romans 8, and we're going to go on to 26th verse. And the previous verses, uh, <clears throat> Paul writes about the hope we have in Christ. Uh, in this hope, we are saved. Verses 23 and 24. What is their hope? Redemption of our bodies. That's the primary reason why we believe in Jesus. The hope of the resurrection. <clears throat> when you're born again, we are born again into a living hope. Every birth is into something. <clears throat> when we say about our birthdays, we say so many years back, I came into the world. I was born into the world. So every birth is into something. And if you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter writes about how God has given us new birth into a living hope. So the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of Christ uh, from the dead, resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and the inheritance can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for us. So this new birth is into a living hope. Hope that is alive, yet to take place. We wait for that hope to be fulfilled by God. And that hope, the redemption of our bodies. This body we live in today will go to dust one day. It will be raised to life. We'll have a new body. In this hope, we are saved. The 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the entire chapter talks about resurrection. How our hope is primarily because of Christ rose from the dead and we have going to rise from the dead and we'll have a new body like Jesus. And the 19th verse of 1 Corinthians 15 chapter, Paul writes, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we should be pitied more than all people. If only for things of this world, we hope in Christ. We pity, he says. I feel sorry for you. Is that why you believe in Jesus? Or is it because of the hope of the resurrection? <clears throat> so the previous verses are basically talking about the primary reason why we believe in Jesus, hope of the resurrection, the redemption of our bodies. Now in verse 26, it goes on a different thing. <clears throat> in the same way, the spirit, not as capitalists, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness. What is our weakness? We don't know how to pray. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words can't express. We don't know what to pray for sometimes, what we ought to pray for. But the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Sometimes this prayer led by the Spirit is groans. In fact, this is one of the ways by the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. Uh, he gives us words to speak. Sometimes we don't even know what those words are. He gives us the gift of tongues. He puts words in our heart and we speak it out by faith. In the first century, second chapter of Acts, verse 4 says, they spoke in tongues as the Spirit enabled them, as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit put in their hearts utterance and they spoke out, that is tongues. And today God wants His people to pray in the Holy Spirit. Yes, we pray with our own minds, no doubt about it. Also, pray in the Holy Spirit. Jude verse 20. Build yourself in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, sometimes they are not even words. They are groans that words can't express. Groans given to us by the Spirit of God. There are different kinds of ways by the Holy Spirit enables us to pray. There are different kinds of tongues. There's one tongue which is a sign for unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 14.22 Another tongue which is basically for the believer Praise in tongues to edify himself or herself. First Corinthians 14, chapter verse 4. A third tongue is when you pray to the Father in heaven, not knowing what you're saying, uttering mysteries in the spirit. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. <coughs> he who prays in tongues doesn't speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries in the spirit. A third kind of tongue. A fourth kind of tongue is the language of angels. First Corinthians 13, chapter verse 1, language of angels. 
And the fifth one is not necessarily words that we pray, but groans that words can't express. Groan from our heart, <clears throat> given to us by the Holy Spirit. So when we are led by the Holy Spirit of God, we will know how to pray. Sometimes we don't even know what we are praying, but we are praying according to the will of the Father. Next verse is written, <clears throat> Verse 27, when he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. The Lord knows our hearts. He searches our hearts. <clears throat> he also knows the mind of the Spirit. He knows our hearts. He knows the mind of the Spirit. So when in our heart we have the right motivation, the right desire, then he enables to pray according to what is in our heart, and that will be granted. Like in uh, Psalm 37, verse 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, to give the desires of your heart. When we are in the Lord, meaning right with God, right relationship with God, and you delight yourself in the Lord, desires you have in your heart are godly desires not ungodly desires. And the Lord knows our hearts. And he enables to pray according to what is in our heart. He knows the mind of the Spirit. When they are both in conformity, then we'll pray according to the will of God and we will know our prayer is heard. So he, he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit and the Spirit intercedes for us <clears throat> according to the will of God. If you're not sure of the will of God, simply ask Holy Spirit to help you to pray. In fact, every time I pray, I suggest to you, we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. Because in John 16, 23, Jesus says, what do you ask the Father in my name? He'll give it to you. And ask the Holy Spirit to help you to pray. He is a helper in prayer. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, with the help of the Holy Spirit. And when he enables you to pray, sometimes he'll enable you to pray with the gift of tongues. <clears throat> pray in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes groans that words can't express. But you know we are praying according to the will of the Father. He intercedes for sin according to the will of God. <clears throat> and therefore, we pray always led by the Spirit of God. In your own language, you know. Sometimes the language you do not even know. If you have the gift of tongues, praise God. Otherwise also, you praise God because he gives you words to pray in your own language and you'll know what you're praying is heard because he intercedes for the saints in accordance with the will of the Father. <coughs> Let's go on. Because Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. So when you pray led by the Spirit, you're always praying according to the will of the Father. And when you pray according to God's will, we know our prayers are heard. Verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This was very well-known verse, very popular verse, but sometimes they are misquoted by people. They take the first part of the verse. In all things, God works together for the good. And leave it at that. But for whom does it work for the good? For those who love God and who have been called according to his purpose. Only such people. To love God means, number one, to obey him. In John 14, 23, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. And also loving God means serving his people. Remember the time when the Lord restored Peter back to the fellowship? He asked him a question. John 21, verse 15. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter says, I know I love you, Lord. You know I love you. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? I love you, Lord. 
take care of my sheep. So when you love God, we will take care of God's people, his sheep. So two aspects of love for God. One is to obey his teachings. Number two, to serve people out of love for God. So in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So the question is, are we fulfilling God's purpose in our lives? Are we living by our own desires or God-planted desires? That's a fundamental question we should ask ourselves. In Acts 13, 36, it's written about David. When David had served God's purpose for his generation, he fell asleep. He buried with four brothers and his body decayed. David fulfilled God's purpose for his generation and he fell asleep. We are called to fulfill God's purpose for our generation. As we're busy fulfilling God's purpose and loving God, then for us, in all things, God works together for the good. <clears throat> I normally give an example, very often I share this, uh, <clears throat> about how to understand in all things, including negative experience, so-called negative experience, in all things, God works together for our good. When you love him, and are fulfilling God's purpose. When I was a small boy in school, whenever I fell sick, as he was taken to a doctor, and he diagnosed the sickness, whether it was dysentery or fever or whatever it was, flu, and he'll give medication. He'll give a prescription. I'll take it to the chemist shop and produce it. And this man will say, oh, you've got an influenza. I'll give influenza mixture. In the chemist shop, we never had those days the modern capsules, different color capsules we have today, different the attractive colors they come in. Those days we had only jars, glass jars with white powders inside, with a chemical name outside the jar. All look alike for a layman like me. For the chemist, a chemist, everything he knows different between one and the other. All white powders and white jars, colorful uh, glass jars with a chemical name outside. He'll take a piece of paper, put it on the table, take a powder from one jar, put the powder in the paper, second jar, second powder, third jar, third powder, five jars, five powders. Put them all together and give it to me. This is your medicine, you can say. I'm curious, I ask him, what is that in the white jar you put first one? Poison. Second jar, poison. Third jar, poison. Five jars, five poisons, put them together, medicine. How wonderful to know that. Individually, they may be poison. Put them together, they are medicine. In the same way, in all things, God works together for the good of those who love God. Take sodium and chlorine. You eat sodium, the tongue will burn. You drink chlorine, your tongue will again burn. Put sodium chloride and chlorine together, salt, NaCl2, adds flavor to the dish. So in all things, God works together for the good of those who love God. So please don't look at a negative experience in an isolated way. Remember, <clears throat> he's working in all things to do what is best for us. He is in control. God does what is best for us. He will never stop doing good to us. He rejoices in doing good to us. Prophesied by Jeremiah, 32nd chapter, 4041. God says, I will never stop doing good to them. I will rejoice in doing good to them. And John 1.16 says, from the fullness of his grace, we will see blessing after blessing today. So God always, in all things, works together for the good of those who love God and even God's his purpose. So what we should be concerned about is, when you go to so-called a negative experience, am I fulfilling God's purpose in my life today? 
am a loving God. If these two conditions are met, then in all things he works together for our good. Verse 29 and 30. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. <coughs> those who God foreknew. God knew from the very beginning who's going to respond to the gospel. He knew. God won't influence our response to the gospel. He wants all people to be saved. But he knows who are the people who are going to respond to the gospel. So whom he foreknew, he will make sure they get to hear the gospel. The word predestined is a word in Greek called proorison, proorison, which means foreordained. Those whom he foreknew, he already knew who is going to respond to the gospel. And those whom he foreknew will respond to the gospel. He predestined, foreordained, that must confirm to the image of the Son. That after you respond to the gospel, you call to become more and more like Jesus. And when you become more and more like Jesus, the purpose of that is we be the firstborn among many brethren. Look at that verse carefully. Please confirm me of likeness of the Son, that he may be the firstborn among many brethren. What is the meaning of firstborn among many brethren? <clears throat> this firstborn is being born again, not the physical birth. Now, as you respond to the gospel and be, be saved, as we become more and more like Jesus, through us, God wants to bring other people to Jesus. And among the others who are going to turn to Christ through you, you are the firstborn among them. Through you, many more become believers. So among this group of the 20 people, you are the first to turn to Christ. Firstborn, among whom? Among many brethren who are going to turn to Christ through you. First among many other people. So through you, when God brings a lot of people to Christ, among those people who come to God through you are the firstborn. First to turn to Christ. But through you, others will also turn to Christ. So firstborn, or the born again, among many brethren who till that point of time had not been born again. So God whom he foreknew, he won't force his will on anybody. Please remember, God wants all people to be saved. Doesn't want anyone to perish. Second Timothy three, Second Peter three nine says, "God is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with everyone, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance." First Timothy two four says, "He wants all people to be saved, and come to knowledge of the truth." Truth is Jesus is the truth. He wants all people to know that. Everybody, no exception. First John chapter 2, verse 2, about Jesus written. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, for the sins of the whole world. He died for everybody in this world. God shows no favoritism today. When the temple in Jerusalem tore into from top to bottom when Christ was crucified, that signified that anybody, Jew, Gentile, leper, Samaritan, anyone can turn to Christ, enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. He wants all people to be saved. And those whom he foreknew will respond to the gospel. He will make sure they get to hear the gospel because their hearts are open. In Jeremiah 29, 13, it's written, God says to his people, you will seek me and find me if you seek me with all your heart. 
when anyone honestly seeks God today, the whole world, he or she will get to hear the gospel. So please remember, God doesn't want anyone to be lost. He died for the sins of the whole world. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gives only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He so loved the world, the whole world he loved. And therefore, don't ever think that only some people God wants to be saved. He wants everyone to be saved. But everyone will not respond to the gospel. I had this question a long time back. Why some people reject the gospel? Lord, why, Lord? This is good news that we're going to heaven. Why do people reject the gospel? And God gave me the answer. In John 3, 19. This is the verdict. Light has come into darkness. But men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds are evil. They prefer to live by the standards of this world rather than receive the eternal life God has promised for all those who receive this eternal life. That's hardness of man's heart. Therefore, let's understand the heart of God is all people are saved. Let's go on. Those before you, he predestined or foreordained to be conformed likeness of a son. Everyone who is saved is called to become more and more like Jesus. In that process, he might be the first born among many brethren. First be born again, and through this born again experience, other people also be born again. <clears throat> Verse 30. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. This predestination is not based on individuals. It's based on response to the gospel. All those who respond to the gospel positively are predestined <coughs> to become believers and become more and more like Jesus. Who respond to the gospel is not to individuals. Every individual can receive this. God won't force his will. He will reveal his will. When they respond positively, in the predestined to become more and more like this, to be saved, he calls them. He sees the hearts of people and he calls them. Those he will call, he justified. After calling us to belong to him, he justifies the calling by giving the resources to live for him. Those whom he called, he justified. First comes the calling. Then comes the justification. First is to respond to this amazing gospel, turn to him, and thereafter receive resources from God, receive the resources he gives us to fulfill his purpose for our lives. Those who may call he justified. Those who may justify, he glorified. Meaning, he'll make us the salt of the earth the light of the world. Because he has put his spirit in our hearts, Christ comes and lives in us. And as we live for him, God will make people see Christ in us. He will lift us up. So that, in turn, when people are touched by our lives, we tell them very clearly, it's by the grace of God I am what I am. He'll make us displays of his splendor. We are the workmanship of God. Like a city on a hill, he lift us up for people to see. To see Christ in us. And as people get attracted to our lives, we only have to tell them who made us who we are. Give all glory to the Lord. All credit must be given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of whom we are who we are. In 1 Corinthians 15, 10, Paul writes, By the grace of God, I am what I am. And the grace of me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God working within me. 
So through the grace of God, we become more and more like Jesus. We are who we are today because of his grace. And when we respond to the call of God, <clears throat> he justifies the calling by giving the resources we need. Second Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. For godliness, to be like Jesus, everything we need is given to us already. That's why in Titus 1, 1 written, the knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. Knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. Knowing the truth, truth is Jesus. Knowing him leads to godliness. When we are godly, our lives will become very, very attractive to people. They come to us and find out, well, how come you are like this? In turn, we glorify Jesus that through that, we become the firstborn among many brethren. That through our transformation, others will get transformed. Let's go on. <coughs> Verse 31. What then should we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? What a powerful verse this is. If God be for us, who can be against us? Now this verse, sentence begins with an if. If God be for us. But some people have a doubt. Is God for me? When you are born again, you know Christ lives in you. You will never doubt God is for you. He is so much for us. He gave his life for us. It's for, it's in a way, it's a sarcastic way of saying, do you not know God lives in you? If he's in you, who can be against you? Why do you fear men? Why do you fear what people might do to you? God is for you. He lives in you. If God be for us, who can be against us? The next verse says, You did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not along with the son, how will he not also along with them, graciously to give us all things? He did not spare his own son, that is the father in heaven. He gave Christ for us. How not along with the Son also graciously give us all things? All things need for life and godliness are given to us graciously. We can't earn these blessings. He gives them by His grace. In John 1 16, we read, From the fullness of His grace, we receive blessing after blessing. It's not just salvation received through Christ. We receive through him everything we need for life and godliness. That's why this life is abundant life. Abundance of peace, joy, the blessings of God, and the privilege of rising above every difficult situation in life. He makes us reign in life through Christ. Every verse in this chapter is so powerful. Go back to it and uh, read it once again. Let it go sink into hearts and minds that we always rejoice in the fact that God is for us. Because he is for us, who can be against us? He gave a son for us. How do wrong with the son? Graciously give us all things. We can't earn these blessings. We receive these blessings because of the grace. May God bless each one of us as we meditate upon every verse in this chapter and enjoy our walk with God. God bless you all.